Hello YouTube, Justin here. This weekend we're going to try to answer how far the stock market can go down because clearly the stock market is going lower. It does not seem like it wants to stop. We are already 10% off the highs. And now we want to just ask, uh, ask ourselves how much lower can the stock market uh, really go? And uh, if the bear market is underway, where exactly are we going to stop? And again, uh, what that basically means is like how low. So at a high level, I'm going to provide those numbers right now and then we will circle back and tell you how we get to these. So. Um, I believe that we're going to go down as far as uh, 384. There is potential for us to go even lower, as low as 337, which would now almost ba basically perfectly align with our previous top, which goes back to February of 2020. So that is where I believe we're going to go. We already already know that um, the bear market of 2022 is starting, and um, it appears like the 2.0. What does that mean? It means that the dead cat bounce that we saw... Uh, about a month ago is now leading to fresh lows, which means that it was a trap. For who? For the bulls. And the bears are currently in control. As we look forward here, again, uh, following up from not doing a video last weekend, selling may and go away. Uh, doesn't that seem like exactly what we should be doing? Uh, I think the answer is yes. And we can clearly see that here by looking at the SPY and by noticing that um, our high of the month here is at about... 429.66 that is almost a perfect rejection off of our green line on the monthly chart which corresponds with our previous lows that go back to q3 of 2021 basically meaning where the green arrow is and uh, the easiest way to look at this one here is to just look at a quarterly chart and uh, we can see here that again my bull case was that we were going to get our one red quarter and then uh, just advance with no lower wick same thing in 2018 same thing in 2020 we're not seeing that at all uh, we're seeing that we actually opened up perfectly uh, validating a head and shoulders pattern, and now we are below. Last quarter's low was 410.64. We're just above that by about 60 cents. It's not all that much, right? 60, 70 cents, not impressive. So this is, this is definitely a break, and um, that is why it's so important that we keep in mind that a quarterly chart is going to include three monthly candles. So right now, as we are opening up the second month, and it is currently... Uh, into the first week of the second month. Again, we're, uh, we're about halfway through the quarter. So if we're halfway through the quarter and we're not seeing anything bullish, is there a reasonable assumption that we should sell in May and go away? Or do we want to try to be those stock picker superstar heroes who can pick the exact stock at the exact bottom and not get hurt? I don't know. So as we're looking to here, it doesn't look all that hot. Um, again, rejecting off of 428 and 430 is not a good look at me for all, uh, not a good look at me at all. And uh, hovering around these lows, and uh, again, I've added in a pink box here. And the reason why I'm adding in the pink box is because, um, again, the dip that was bought in uh, right in uh, December, January, February, March, that's why we see these lower wicks. Um, that's all red now. Why? Well, we're below the range. We can see that all these dip buyers uh, went down as far as roughly uh, 415. Anything below 430, they loved it. And now everyone's red. But we don't quite see the volume flush out to actually uh, unwind all of this buying from the last, uh, right, uh, one, two, three, four, five months here. So again, sell in May and go away. Um, but it appears like it is definitely coming into play this year. S&P re-enters 10% territory and it is not exiting. We can clearly see that, again, on a weekly perspective, we also got that rejection off of the blue line, which corresponds with roughly 432. And that is a 10% drop off the highs. Um, we also see QQQ re-entering and holding negative 20% territory. So as we look forward here to QQQ, well, we can notice just that um, it's pretty much the same thing. We see a huge uh, influx in volume. And as we go lower, the volume is ramping up. That is not good at all. Um, and this is important because the, uh, the high um, for, uh, uh, for 2020 is a lot lower, right? It's a, almost a hundred. It's uh, it's almost a hundred points lower, right? We're looking at about 80 points here. Um, I don't think we're going to go down that far. It's definitely not going to be a straight line either. I believe we're going to find support at that S and P level I called out. But we have to keep in mind that uh, Nasdaq is uh, already in bear market territory, and if uh, right tech leads spy. Um, we have to be mindful of this, that if it's going to drag us lower, we have to be very careful. Um, I do also believe that um, we could be. Um, so let's talk about this, and then I'll, and I'll mention the bull case in a moment here. So bear market targets. What did we get to? Well, we got to 449. We got to 430. We made it down to 405, but we've not quite gotten to that 400.67 gap that is still on the SPY chart. So I believe that um, if we're not going to test that right now, um, we, we need to test it soon. We need to get at least a test at 400 to see what the reaction is going to be. Do buyers show up as we would expect, or are they waiting for a lower level? 
The reason why I'm calling out for 380 and 336 is because uh, it's just technical levels, right? 10% takes us to 432, 20% takes us to 384, and then 30% takes us to 336. So the fact that the S&P got all the way up to roughly 480, it was like 479.98, yep, um, means that now if we're going to start correcting, um, these levels are going to be very important. I believe that we're going to get a Powell put around 384, which means that he's going to stop being as hawkish as he is right now. Um, we're going to talk about Powell a little bit later in the show, but that is where this 20% uh, off the highs comes from. And what I would note is that um, if we look at the percent decline that we've already had, um, as of the close on Friday, we're down by roughly 15%. And what I'm calling for is, again, potentially a drop of 20%. So what does that mean? We are three quarters of the way there, or roughly 15 out of the 20%. So 15 out of 20 is equal to 75%. So we are three quarters of the way down to the first bear market target of 384. But it might not feel like that. And um, again, it is a very sobering thought that we're going to be going lower. I think a lot of people are hitting their pain threshold but I still believe a lot are holding on and hoping and praying things are gonna turn around. So again, um, it also says not all necessarily in 2022. Um, it appears like we are gonna go into recession because we already have one quarter of contraction. All it takes is one more for a technical recession. And um, again, we can definitely avoid it, uh, but with the decisions from the Fed this week, I believe that is gonna be a tall order. So again, 339 is the 2020 all-time high, and then um, 336 is that 30% off the high. So now we're going to go through uh, something important here because um, individual stocks are now down a lot. And um, the index itself, again, QQQ down by roughly 20, which means that we have to make back 20% to recoup that loss. S&P is here at about 15. So again, split the difference. Uh, for every 10, you got to make 11. But what's important is that when we look at uh, the bigger percent declines here, like uh, get 50, um, to make your money back, you got to make 100%. For 75%, you got to make 300 so for a name like Shopify, um, again, uh, this is a Canadian darling. Uh, we can see that it is now off by 75% off its highs. So if and when the market does decide to turn around um, and you believe in Shopify, not that I'm endorsing it, um, what does that mean? If you've lost money and you haven't blown up, um, even if you only have a third of your account left, again, in a perfect scenario, if Shopify goes from where it is right now back to its highs, it's gonna rip up 400%. What does that mean? You have the chance to recoup all of your losses. But what you have to do is be strategic and very smart about the next stocks you buy, where you buy them, and how long you're going to hold on for. And um, it means that there's always another chance. It's called tomorrow. As long as you don't blow up today, there is always going to be another opportunity and another trade waiting for you around the corner. So it means that you want to be selective. And if we're in a sell in May and go away period, now might not be the time to really start, again, uh, using some of your last bullets. You want to make sure you're going to be strategic because um, the market will turn. Uh, the Fed will pivot. When's it going to be? I don't know. But right now, we are definitely in the don't fight the Fed and the Fed wants to tighten. So what does that mean? We're probably going to be going lower. Um, it's not a thought that I like to uh, overly emphasize, but we have to be, have to be mindful of it. So with that in mind, um, if we're only down by 15 on SPY and we're potentially going to be going down more, what are the warning signs which could tell us that we're going to be going there? Um, I'll go through that actually really briefly here because I think it's important. So I want to start here by looking at ARC. And by looking at ARC, um, this is a chart that I actually laid out at the beginning of the year where I started to notice some similarities between the psychology chart of the market cycle over here on the right hand side compared to ARC over here on the left hand side. And um, we can just go through some of the similarities and where I started to really get um, uh, feel uh, apprehensive about this was right around 84 on ARC. Well, we started to lose the relative low here. Again, we're looking for that red line right here. So let's just go through the similarities and uh, let's see what happened here. So, right, there's our dip. There's our slingshot all the way up. Uh, same thing that happened here, right? There's disbelief. There's hope. Um, there's optimism. There's belief. There's thrill. There's euphoria. I am a genius. We're all going to get rich. Complacency happens. Ah, Kathy knows. Kathy knows. Kathy knows. We just got to cool off for the next rally. Anxiety. Why am I getting margin calls? Isn't that what was circulating this last week here? Margin calls. People are actually uh, Googling margin calls. They have no idea what it is. Anxiety. Then we got... Uh, uh, capitulation, right? My, uh, I'm actually not sure what that one is. Um, my investments are with, uh, I think that's denial. So anxiety, denial. My investments are with great companies. They will come back. Heard that exact same thing from Kathy. 
Shit, right? Panic. Shit, everyone's selling. I need to get out. And now we have capitulation. And um, what I want to do right now is actually focus on that capitulation uh, thing for a moment here because I think it's important for us to understand that capitulation does not signal a bottom. Um, what capitulation actually does is signals a period where, again, people are saying, I'm getting 100% out of the market. I can't afford to lose more. Uh, for me, um, psychology says that, again, the psychology chart here on the, on the right-hand side tells us that if we're in capitulation, this is not the bottom. If we look at the amount of time it took for us to go from disbelief to capitulation, it's roughly that same period for us to go from capitulation to disbelief to start the new bull market. So how long has it been since Kathy has been uh, on, on the decline here? Oh, God, right? Oh, no. Oh, no. It's been two years. So two years from 2020 to 2022 here. That is a long, long, long time. And if we're now going to go into the period where, um, again, this is the period of frustration where people are going to be saying, right, um, whose fault is it that X happened to me? Whose fault is it that I blew up? Whose fault is it that I lost everything? Whose fault is it that I can't afford to lose more? Um, right? That's what people are doing right now. They're looking to point the finger. I think that's where we're starting to get into. So um, until we start to see anger, depression, I believe that the riskiest assets, including ARK, are not finding a bottom. Why? We're not seeing what we need to see in every other normal market cycle. We also need time on the chart. People need to really understand whether or not uh, being down by, I don't know how much that is right now, like 70%, whatever it is. Um, Right, we're currently down by about 70% here on ARC, 72. So what's very interesting about this is that we are uh, almost at the target that I was calling for on my original bear market of 2022 thesis at the beginning of this year. So what this means is that we're actually much closer to puking up the whole move or coming right back down to where we were during disbelief. So uh, going from roughly 45 to 37, there's not really all that much left in downside. I talked about how um, right, to go from here down to where we need to go, right, it's about another 15-20%. Um, I mentioned the S&P is now looking for roughly another 5% or only about 25% of the total move for us to get down to that 20% off the highs. So if S&P is closer to finding its support than it is to the all-time highs, and we know that QQQ was already in bear market territory, ARK is uh, telling us that we're much closer to the bottom than we were before, are there any other any any other risk assets which are also telling us that we might be closer to a bottom than we might be to a top? Well, let's look at the Russell, right? Uh, the Russell here is, uh, again, the Russell 2000, which includes 2,000 small cap stocks. And uh, what I'm noticing here is that we look back to the previous tops in 2018 and 2020. Again, basically where we were before that big, uh, right, lockdown drop and the slingshot higher. Oh, wow, we're almost there. Yep. Um, what was resistance should now become support. We also have this 200 weekly moving average here and we have the 50 monthly moving average here. What is that? It should be very strong support. So where I would expect to find some support on the Russell is gonna be right around this area of about uh, low 170s. And from where we closed on Friday, um, we're only looking for about, come on, it'd be great if you could work computers. Uh, we're only looking for about another 5% in downside, right? So uh, the Russell is now much closer to support than it was uh, before. Um, ARC, much closer to support than it was before. And um, the big question for me is, if we can find support at these areas, including Russell at roughly 172, ARC at roughly uh, right uh, high, th high 30s, 37-ish, um, and then also uh, on SPY at uh, roughly 384, depending on whether or not we bounce and stall out, meaning we don't take out the relative low, we gotta take out the relative low and the relative high to signal a reversal. So what could happen here is that we actually just get another dead cap bounce before hitting our ultimate target, which would be 30% on SPY, or that same level we're looking at on the Russell over here. So um, what's gonna be very important is that I believe we're gonna get a dead cap bounce off 400, but ultimately make it down to roughly 384. And then what I don't know is how we're gonna react to this area here. Do we stall out and go flat? Um, do we come down and then uh, dead cap bounce lower? Do we come into here and then Powell actually is like, you know what, I was too hawkish. I'm going to be more like the uh, BOE and the ECB and we start to resume back up. I believe this area right here is going to be the most important barrier. Everyone is looking at it. Money managers, myself, and um, almost anyone who is in the know in the market. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, um, again, I just want to make sure that uh, there is some hope here. Is it 100% uh, hope? No. 
Uh, but I want to get through a few more things, and then uh, we're going to look at some options, we're going to look at some charts, and then we're going to wrap it up. Aiming for a shorter video, video this week, um, we'll see where we end up. Why bull or bear? Again, no video last week, so this one's important because um, we just want to see whether or not um, what it would take for us to be bullish or bearish is giving us more evidence. Um, I've changed out the bull one here to, again, dip into earnings is going to be easier to rally after. <laughs> Clearly, that didn't happen. Good earnings, uh, that, that's, a, that's a sell. Uh, weak earnings, that's a sell. And um, I think that um, because we're seeing a lot of uh, good news, meaning uh, beat on top and bottom line, like companies like Airbnb, Datadog, Tesla, um, Apple, but guiding down, um, all of these ones here, again, excluding Apple with the guidance, um, they all got a haircut anyways. They all took a leg down. Why? Because there is nowhere safe to hide. Um, in, a, in a market where everyone is scared, we're right back here to fear, almost back into extreme fear. Um, we look at the timeline, and it doesn't really look all that much better. Uh, come on, load up. Uh, right, we're, we we got uh, very scared, right, extreme fear. Then we got back up here to neutral, right? That's the dead cat bounce. And now we're right back down to fear, almost back into extreme fear. So um, if the market bottoms on extreme fear, but this one here was just the dead cat bounce, what do we need? We need to see a lower low. Ah, also, um, what we talked about earlier this week was uh, the number of S&P 500 stocks, which are currently below their 200 DMA. And that is sitting at about uh, 35% that are still above. Uh, when we bottomed in 2018 and in 2020, we had less than 10%. It was roughly 10% in 2018, roughly 15% in 2020. So these stocks are not quite low enough for us to say that the parameters are met. If we get to 384, I believe we will get that. So what is actually holding up in the market right now? Uh, we look at the last one week performance and it's pretty obvious that the size of Amazon's block is almost equal to the energy complex over here. So Amazon down by seven and energy up by seven, eight, 12, 13 is just offsetting each other. And then as we, as we look across here, it's pretty mixed, right? Uh, credit services down, banks up, um, right? Healthcare up, uh, trillion dollar companies all mixed. Um, semiconductors trying to find some support. So now the question is, is the theme of the last seven days the same theme we've been seeing year to date? Why? Because that's when the correction really started, basically in January. Ah, it's almost the same thing. But when we look here, it's now much more obvious that, again, uh, energy rocking right over here. Defensives. Yep. Uh, right. Uh, um, those companies. I uh, don't want to mention the name. YouTube doesn't like it. And then looking over here, um, what's the biggest red? Oh, no, it's NVIDIA. So chips leading uh, tech, tech leading spy. And we look over here at some of the assets, uh, again, some of the technology companies that are, again, more cloud-based or information services, they're quite red, right? CRM down 33, Intuit down 38, Adobe down 31, um, right? Uh, AMD down by 33, Facebook down by 39, uh, Amazon down by 31, Netflix down by 70, Disney, Disney down by 30. Um, the S&P is, is incredibly resilient. When we look at the stocks that make it up here, which are not very, that's not very strong. And uh, now we're seeing that, right, Amazon now in that 30% level. Um, what it's going to take is these bigger dominoes like uh, Tesla, Apple, Microsoft, Google to start getting down to, again, that bright red territory of roughly negative 30. So the value compression might be what we are now going to see for the bull catalyst. It does not mean we will. Um, but right now, from a PE perspective for the broader market, we're at levels we've not seen in the last five years, which means that, believe it or not, the market is cheaper today than it was uh, in the last five years. So there's, there is value out there. However, cheap does not always mean cheap enough. So um, the saying is that the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. And um, I think a lot of opportunities are being presented right now, again, and no, no, notably in names that beat on the top and bottom line and raised guidance, like who? Like Tesla, um, like Airbnb. Um, but are they being rewarded right now? No, it means that we're going to get a much better chance to get in. If we now look at the bear case, again, we got 454 Impenetrable Fortress. We got DXY and TNX, uh, TNX breakouts, recession risk, and then tech leading the decline. Let's go through these one by one here. So 454 Impenetrable Fortress. Uh, absolutely. Yep. Um, S&P has been unable or unwilling to get to that 454 area. That is going to be the red line right here. On the weekly chart, we're still definitely funneling lower by this white triangle that we have laid out here. And um, we did get a break in volume. So, right, we started to see, uh, right, uh, the coil winding up and the coil got released. So for the last three weeks, uh, sorry, last four weeks, we've seen higher volume and declining price. 
which for me means that, um, again, we're starting to actually see that capitulation. But is capitulation the bottom? No, it's not. Capitulation is just uh, the period where we start to go sideways. So we were going up, we were going flat, now we are going down. And capitulation is the area between here and anger where we start to what? Go sideways. Ah. Oh. So, ah, yeah, we're definitely going lower, but I believe that we're getting closer to the period where we're going to start to flatten out. Again, it might be a 384, it might be a 400. I still really believe 384 is going to be the number. Um, we also even have a Fibonacci extension here. So, again, going back to the last 10% drop, which is in September of 2020, um, right, we had a decline of 10%. There's your technical correction. And the Fibonacci extension, or the 161, aligns with what? Ah, crap, 384. Right, that number keeps coming up over and over and over. And then, uh, right, uh, moving averages are not quite there, but on the weekly chart, um, we're clearly seeing that uh, 454 is an impenetrable fortress. When we look over here at DXY, or the dollar index, the dollar is uh, doing very well just because of the, um, right, uh, the divergence between other major central banks. Uh, BOE pretty much saying we're in stagflation. Um, the Bank of, Bank of Japan pretty much telling us that um, we're buying more bonds. We're stimulating more. So the dollar is on a relentless move higher with a massive W. So because we see that big W, um, it starts to get me a little bit anxious. Um, anxious because um, this is something that can hurt the market. The king dollar is definitely very prominent right now. Um, so we have a big W here on uh, right DXY. And then if we look over here at the VIX, right, uh, the VIX, what do we have here forming as well? Ah, crap, another W. Yep. Another W, and another W where? Above 30. 30 on the VIX means that we're now in a period of elevated um, volatility. So we see a W on the VIX, we see a W on TNX, and we're also getting a bull break here, right? Closing back above 30 is a period that we've not really seen hold for a while, until when? Until we got that big move in 2020. So we've already price discovered over it three times, we're forming a W, and uh, it looks like it wants to go higher here, right? There's our dub. So same thing as a dollar, it's building up pressure. It looks like it wants to release. And then finally, uh, uh, TNX. So as we look over here to TNX or the 10 year treasury note, um, we're gonna look at this on a uh, monthly chart just because um, again, uh, the move is very powerful, but we have to zoom out to really understand where we're coming from. So going all the way back to the late 1980s, basically when I was born, I was born in 1988. Um, we can note that um, every time we hit the downtrend or roughly the 200, uh, 200 moving average on the monthly, which is gonna be the grain line, it's a rejection. Gets over the 50, can't quite make it to the 200, that's a sell. And that's what we're noticing here. Uh, it actually broke out. So from where we were in 2020 to where we are now, we have seen an increase of, right, 700%. And what's very important here is that we're now take, we're now testing a key relative low, which goes back to where? 2003, right? We're talking about roughly that 2000 period. So if we're now taking out the relative highs, which are right here from uh, 2018, from 2014, and 2011, uh, if we're going to keep going up, oh man, it's going to start squeezing. Where? Uh, 40, which means we're going to get another 1% on the 10-year treasury note. Um, the way TNX works here on uh, TC2000 is that it gives us 31, but you have to drop a decimal point, which means that right now, the 10-year treasury note is at 3.1%. If we go up to 41, it means we're going to be at 4.1%. It's going to hurt technology stocks and uh, the S&P again. So I'm seeing that um, all three of these are giving me, again, uh, that one there, that's the only thing I can think about for the bulls, right? That's it. And the Powell put, but that comes at 384. Tina, scratched out. 454, check. DXY TNX breakouts, check. Recession risk, yes, um, yes. Uh, I think it's gonna be harder for us to avoid a recession now just because we already have one uh, under our belts. And uh, the way recessions work is that um, you have to be growing at a negative rate compared to before. And because we had unprecedented um, stimulus from the government, right, Burr, um, it means that it's gonna be harder for us to meet those thresholds of last year. A recession does not mean a depression. It just means that we're, we're contracting. Um, that's, that's normal. Um, after you get a huge raise, what do you do? You spend a whole bunch of money. And then at a certain point, you're like, you know what? I think maybe I've spent enough. And that's kind of where the overall market is right now. Um, so when we look here, again, recession risk is definitely real. Tech leading the decline. Well, again, we looked at the heat map here, right? Year to date, when we zoom out all the data, oh, yep, uh, we're definitely seeing chips lead tech and tech leads buy. It doesn't look great. So, right, check, 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 check. And then uh, surprises for this week, we got CPI and then maybe Russia. 
So in terms of key dates, uh, there's not that many, but these ones here are going to really matter post the Fed. On Wednesday, we got CPI. Um, this is going to be the most important data point for the entire week. Um, if it comes in really hot, it means that, yep, uh, two 50 basis point hikes for the next couple of meetings might not be enough. Maybe we have to go above where the Fed wants to go. And Jerome said he is ready, willing, and able. Thursday, we got jobless claims and then PPI, or the Producer Price Index. That is a, uh, um, a, uh, a data point which is similar to CPI, but PPI is going to be a leading indicator for CPI. Again, Producer Price Index, Consumer Price Index. So when the producers uh, are being charged more to produce stuff, that'll feed through, feed through to the CPI later. So these data points, as we're going through to Thursday, are going to be very important. All right, so now with all that said, what is our support and resistance for this week? Well, um, let's look at the top here first. So right now, again, the week, weekly update for the S&P for the week of May 9th, there is a bear market status, right? Very obvious, yeah, we're in a bear market. Can't deny it. 384 is 20% off the all-time high and my current target, where again, target does not mean that's where I think the bottom is. It means we have to watch for the reaction. If we can get above 428 or back above that area we mentioned before, and again, just a re refresher where that comes from, it comes right here from our monthly chart, which feeds, feeds through from our quarterly chart, where we have to get above 428 and 430 to take out the quarterly base that we formed here, minimum, right? We can't get above this area. We're not gonna go back up higher. So above 428 means that we're in a kangaroo market, which means we do not have clear direction. If we can then also clear 432, that means that we are now exiting correction territory. And again, correction territory meaning 10% uh, off the highs. If we can get back above the blue line, we're out of correction, um, right? So again, 10% uh, off the highs coming down into here. If we can now bounce and get back above the blue line, it means we're out of correction. Um, and then uh, that means that there's potential for a new bull market. Where does confirmation come? Above 454. We have to take out that, uh, that head and shoulders neckline. In terms of support, um, again, we're here sitting at center field. So support is going to come from 411, which is going to be a February and April low. Then we got 405, which is our current year to date low. And then 400, it's 400.67. There's a gap there. There's a gap at 400.67. In terms of resistance, uh, 415, which is going to be the March and April low. So a lot of the levels that we're looking at are just going to correspond with the relative lows that we have here, right? For uh, 415, 410, right? 420.7. It's basically every $5. So the numbers are very similar just because um, that's, again, what was support should now be resistance. Then we got 421, which is going to be our January low. And then we got 430, which would print a weekly higher high. So um, with all that said, um, these are some pretty big numbers. Uh, if we look at where we are, there's about 10 points in support for downside, and there's about uh, 20 points in resistance to the upside. What does that mean? The path higher is gonna be a lot more difficult than the path lower. All right, now let's tie this all together and provide a base case. So the base case here is that, and again, this is for the month of April. Uh, I think I forgot to update this for me. Oops, in hindsight, I probably should have done that. Tina for stocks, scratch that out. Uh, 454 pivot, yes, it was what? It was a bear pivot. The bears definitely took control. Earnings confirmed what? A bear market. Why? Let's look at the chart. We got four, we got five. One, two, three, four, five back to back red weeks, right? Uh, that's definitely bearish. We got the volume confirmation as well. So price action confirmed by volume. It's bearish. Um, moving forward um, to the bulls. So what do the bulls got in the tank? Uh, not all that much, right? This is from uh, two weeks ago where we talked about um, Tina or there is no alternative. Is there, is there, is there an alternative to the US dollar? Um, as of right now, I would say no. Um, alternative to the stock market? Yes. Why? Uh, cash, bonds. Um, but the American stock market is still king. Pricing power? Mm. I think that one's a yes, but it is showing some chinks on the armor. Um, again, being the, uh, the sexiest horse in the glue factory does not mean you're going to survive. It just means that you look the best compared to your peers. Military, I would say yes. Politics, with midterms coming up, Joe Biden is at a uh, presidential low. So pretty hard to say that uh, the politics are strong in America, but the international politics are definitely strong. Why? The West is united. All right, these pesky bears, right? Yes, we talked about them, right? They look cute until they don't. Uh, moving forward here, bear market targets. We already went through them. So again, we got 384, we got 400, 384, and 330s as our next stop. So that pretty much corresponds with uh, what we laid out here on our monthly chart for quite some time. I already have the levels here. Um, we got that 
2020 high here at 340. We got our uh, right our, uh, our 50 monthly moving average at 342, and um, that seems like the next stop if we can't stop uh, stop here at 384. Um, I don't think this one here is going to happen uh, in this current push lower. I think we're going to get a dead cat bounce between 400 and 384. Um, that's what I believe. In terms of the bear case as well, there's a couple other things, including options we'll look at in a moment, but the Fed rhetoric. So the Fed rhetoric here is, uh, is quite difficult because um, the Fed is losing credibility but does not want to admit it. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, I'll defer to people who are smarter than me. Um, again, this is from Bloomberg. Um, this was published on May 6th, which is uh, Friday, yesterday. Um, this is in the afternoon as well at 4 o'clock. Um, Powell's inflation strategy takes fire from ex-top Fed officials. Chair takes the most heat from ex-colleagues since 1970s. Former officials predict a recession in much higher rates. Who was talking? Uh, Richard Clarida, right, who was Powell's vice chair until January. Said, the, uh, said, that, said this week that interest rates will have to go to levels his former boss hasn't acknowledged. What does that mean? Credibility. And then there's Randall Cor uh, Corals, right? Randy Corals. Um, until October, Powell's other vice chair for supervision was harder hitting, saying the team ought to have started battling infl inflation last September. And the Fed now faces a likely recession to bring prices under control. We also have people like uh, Larry Summers, um, right? Uh, Treasury Secretary Larry Summers said on Friday he was surprised that he took it off the table as firmly as he did. We're talking about that 75 basis point hike. And then we also have people like um, the criticism of former colleagues as the sharpest and most widespread, blah, blah, blah. Um, we also have, uh, where's Bill Dudley? Um, so the duo has uh, has plenty of uh, the, the duo, meaning uh, Randy Corals and uh, Rich Clarida, have plenty of uh, have plenty of company. Alan Blinder, who served as vice chair under former Fed uh, chief Alan Greenspan, and William Dudley, part of the Fed's leadership through 2018 as former president of the New York uh, Reserve, are among those seeing a recession. So what's very important here is that um, again, people who were just at the Fed only months ago, um, including uh, right. Uh, um, Richard Clarida and then also uh, uh, Randy Cordles are trying to distance, distance themselves from the Fed. Why? They think there is a huge policy mistake being made here and they can speak freely because they don't work there anymore. So um, what we were talking about uh, before was that the risk of other people who are, again, no longer at the Fed. Larry Summers used to be the Treasury Secretary during the 2000s. Um, Alan Blinder used to be in charge during Alan Greenspan. Um, Bill Dudley was the New York uh, uh, New York uh, governor governor and uh, part of the Troika, which is where um, Williams is right now. Um, he's saying the same thing. They're all seeing a recession here, and um, this is uh, not good. So there's definitely a credibility issue, and um, Jerome has a very tough job right now. So I don't um, I don't envy him at all. Um, but what it, what it means is that the Fed rhetoric is very important. And what's even more important is that we have not even seen the balance sheet start to run off, which is going to start in, ju in June, on June 1st. And if they're doing it at two times the rate and they're doing it into a period where they're trying to avoid a recession, how the hell are they going to do that? Why? Every time this orange line or the Fed balance sheet shrinks, the market goes down. And when the, when the orange line goes up, market goes up. So if we already have one... Uh, one quarter of economic contraction, which is the half of a recession, and we get one more, I think the Fed is going to induce it. And uh, the question is whether or not they're going to create a recession or a depression. And that's what I was mentioning when I talk about, are we going to find support at 384? Are we going to find support on ARC at uh, 30, uh, 37 uh, down here at the low? Are we going to find support on IWM at 172? And I would say that if the Russell cannot stabilize here at 172, what does normal technical analysis tell us? If it rejects here, um, this is now going to be tough resistance. And that is likely going to drag the S&P down to a lower target. So it's very important that we understand that a lot of these risk assets, even including Bitcoin, NYXBT, are now flashing some warning signs here. I had a pen and drawn for uh, BTC going all the way back to October, and it lost it. That's a bear break. So... Um, all the riskiest assets are now telling us that, yeah, um, it seems pretty likely that we're going to be going lower. And why? Well, money has three options. This is the TINA. So money can go into stocks, which has a high risk and a high PE. Right now, the PE is a lot more um, reasonable, but people are scared. The fear is high. Bonds, um, locking in and guaranteeing an adjusted real loss as of right now. 
Um, Jamie Dimon this week said that uh, the 10-year note could go as high as 5%. That seems pretty attractive for a risk-free, risk-free return when the market is what? In free fall. And then cash. Um, Rick Ryder at BlackRock said that, uh, right, we're holding onto cash with both hands. Um, heard the same thing from uh, Calsters. I forget the guy's name right now. What are they saying? We're waiting for the right dip. Why? They're aware that they're getting hurt and uh, they have to wait until they find the right dip to try to recoup the losses because if we're now free falling, the deeper we cut, when we do rebound, that is when the tremendous gains are made. Tremendous. So it's very important that we keep that in mind. And uh, money goes where? Um, again, this is from Rick Ryder, again, from BlackRock. Um, this is from two weeks ago. He was showing us how there is now a reasonable alternative to high dividend stocks in the U.S. What is it? It's a U.S. investment grade three-year yield. The difference is now at zero, right? That's the blue line here down at zero. And during that same time, um, TNX, or in the roughly the last two weeks, has put in what? Another rally. We went from 2.8 to 3.1. That's an additional 10%. Oh, man, another 10%? Yep. Which means that now you're better off actually buying an investment grade bond than buying a high yield bond. Last slide here before we actually look at the options and then at the uh, the technicals is just that um, this was part of the other thing which got me very sober um, when I started doing my bear market analysis of 2022 in uh, December and January. We have roughly 150 months of expansion from the late 1980s th- through to where we are now. And again, that's the same time when we saw that uh, 10-year Treasury note start its massive decline. So is it a, is it, is it a coincidence? I don't think so. Um, we look back to here again. When did it, when did it start its real decline? Uh, 1988, 1989. We look back to here. That's when the market started going big booms, right? 1989, 1988, to where? Um, to 2000. So 150 months of expansion, 600% rally, and then what? Negative 50. We lost 50%. And then in uh, 2008, to where we were uh, at the beginning of the year, 154 months of expansion, roughly the same as the previous expansion, also 600%. And now we could be starting what? Um, If we can't save these levels, there is the potential that we are starting the lost decade that Ray Dalio has always talked about. And that right here would be defined by, let's go to a log scale so it's easier for us to see. Um, It would be defined here by this impenetrable fortress, right, at uh, mid uh, mid 4,000s. And um, it would be us forming another M where we go all the way up, we top out, we form the uh, first part of the M, which would be this first wave, dead cap bounce back up come back down for a lower low, and then ultimately rally back up. So there are some major headwinds here if the bear market is underway. We know the areas we're watching for from the support and resistance, and we also know where we would expect to find buyers. It does not mean it is where we will find buyers. So now, um, what I want to look at is, um, do I not even have it up? Uh, Let me just double check here. So there's one thing I wanted to review, including options. So let's look at that next right here. And then um, I do want to go through some technical charts and uh, just make sure that the story is a little bit more clear by the time we wrap all this up. Let's go here to options. So now what I want to point out is that um, I'm seeing some supporting evidence for what I was already looking for. What I was already looking for was um, some specific targets. So let's find out what those are and um, let's go through to here. So if uh, we know that CPI is coming in on Wednesday and PPI comes in on Thursday, we want to look at the options chain to see whether or not people are already positioned for a bear move. As of right now, uh, for Monday, uh, May 9th, max pain for me looks it's, looks like it's about 410 because at the money uh, to lower is what we're noticing. So 410 call to 41015, 410 put to 405 put. Looking up to Wednesday, we're seeing continuation, much more muted though. Um, And then we look at Friday. Here is where it is very interesting to me. There is no calls. They are MIA again. But people are holding on to puts. They're holding on to them in open interest as well. So when we look here, there's a 410, 405 put spread. Where does it take us back down to? The low of the year, 405. And uh, these 405 puts are worth $5. Where do they break even? At 405. Sorry, 400. That area we're already looking for. So by Friday, we could reasonably be at 405 or 400 again. Oh, cool. Yeah, cool, Justin. Thanks. Thanks. Um, And now we look here at May 20th. This is going to be the May monthly expiry. Um, I'm looking at the 16s, which just means the eight strikes above and eight strikes, sorry, eight strikes above and eight strikes below. And the first thing that sticks out to me again is that calls are MIA. There's one stack that's above 10,000 year in open interest. It's at 410. On the put side, woof. 
Uh, right, we got 410, 405, volume, open interest. Yikes. There's continuation from what we looked at from the, from Friday this week. And then if we go beyond the 16s, here's where I notice a 410, 390 put spread. And again, what's the levels I'm looking for? 384. What's interesting here is that at 410, we have 100,000 in open interest, 30,000 in volume. At 400, right, we got 137 and 137,000 in open interest, 36,000 in volume. And that is almost the exact same as what we see here at 390, where we have 120,000 in open interest, 34,000 in volume. These are put spreads. Um, I didn't want to go down too much further because there's puts all the way down. But what this means is that if these 390s, again, are going to get anything, um, they have to be $3 lower. We have to be at 387. Oh, that's actually, that's actually pretty close to 384. Yep, it's within 1%. So that's how we can actually get there. The second thing I found very interesting is when I went through our option reports, um, again, top 25 indices here, I pulled out the two things that I found that were very important here. Uh, first one here is that there's a 4145 straddle that was placed on May 2nd for $120 million. So where were we on May 2nd? All right, let's just hide everything here. Let's look at May 2nd. So right here on uh, May 2nd, right, which is the day where we had that big powerful drop, right, uh, sorry, right here, right on the Monday, when we weren't sure what we were going to do, right? That's when we dove down to 405, came back up. I don't know what time of the day that these were bought, but... Um, where am I here? Let's go back to here. Um, I don't know what time these were bought, but what I do know is that this is a strategy. I've not seen straddles being placed in quite some time. So what's interesting here is that we can take the strike, um, again, 4145, and we can take the premium or roughly 175 and 145 to know what is their break even. It's 320 points. We have to go up or down by 320 points for them to get what? Their $120 million back by June. So what we have here is, uh, right, uh, 4145 plus uh, 320 equals 4465. What is that? That is right at our neckline, right? Again, going back to here, if we go to um, SPX, 454, right, 454. That is our neckline right here from what? Our head and shoulders. So our head and shoulders neckline is at 454. And they're betting that we have to be above that to get their money back. Or we have to be, we have to be down here at 3825. And that is uh, 4145 minus 320. So they think we're either going to be hitting that Powell put area or correction territory, or we're going to be out of the uh, bear market. We're going to be above that neckline. Woof, right? That's a pretty big move. 320 points. And then on May 5th, they bought more. And the one on May 5th is actually more interesting because it's the one day where the VIX actually calmed down, right? Uh, sorry, on May 5th here, that was on Thursday. The VIX was got calm, calm on, uh, it got dropped hard below 30 on Thursday, on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, we had that gap down. I don't know if these were probably bought at the open, if I was to guess, um, right? They're here at 11.04 Eastern. So I can see them right here. Last trade was at 11.04. So before lunch, before that really uh, started the drop, they bought more. They bought $500 million worth of 4,200 straddles. These are for January, which means they have even more time on the chart. It's for $500 million. So same levels here. We can take 4,200, which is the straddle strike. Oops, let's look here, sorry. Um, these ones were purchased by 1015. So basically uh, by the open in the first 45 minutes, they have their trade on. 7,500 uh, calls, 7,500 puts. This is 100% a straddle. It's also confirmed by other orders here, which I'll go through in a moment. So 4,200 straddle, which means that we have 315 and 355 again. I'm just roughly uh, guessing here for premium. It's about three, 670, give or take a couple of points. And now we look and see, okay, well, if we're at 4,200 and uh, they think they, uh, they, they need 670 points to get their money back, what are those levels? It's 4,870 or 3530. 30. Again, uh, basically back to uh, new all-time highs or deeper down into correction territory. Getting closer to where? Getting closer to the um, bear market target too. Right, uh, 384 is what we're looking for. And then we're looking for 340s, 330s, high 330s for our next target. We can also note here that they're buying naked calls at 4650 and naked puts at 3550, putting on more, more money. Um, so this pretty much confirms that people, again, are placing hundred, hundreds of millions of dollars in orders at these exact same levels, which for me gives me, gives me more evidence. And... I think I might have lost my other screen now here.
All right, great. It actually came back. It would have been sucky if I had to re-record it. Um, anyways, um, do I still have my uh, my screen up here? Yes, I do. Perfect. So let's go forward because I'm realizing that this is becoming a longer video, but I think it's really important to understand where we came from versus where we're going. So one more time, let me resummarize uh, what I think is happening here. So the broader market, S&P, again, uh, we're looking at a weekly chart here. Um, we have our 200 weekly moving average coming in roughly at uh, right uh, 346, which is pretty close to our 2020 all-time high. So when we look at the areas of support we would expect to find, again, I'm looking for that 20% cut. We see the options which uh, tell us we could already get there. 20% is where we're going. We're already down by 15, which means we're three quarters of the way there. If you haven't already taken some uh, some risk, uh, risk off the table, um, I'm not sure that right now, right here, is the perfect time to be folding. Um, trimming is good. I don't know that exiting is going to be ideal. So we're three quarters of the way there. And because we're three quarters of the way there, I'm not sure what's going to happen at 384. But that's the area where, where I would expect to find short covering. I would expect to find some repositioning from the Fed. And I would expect to find some buyers. Why? I'm looking to buy. So that's where I get excited. Next thing is that we talked about, uh, again, the assets which, which have been getting hit the hardest, like the Russell. And the Russell here, again, uh, 2018 top, 2020 top, should now be support. It should. And uh, this is so important because... Um, the S&P uh, is at 30% to hit that 2020 all-time high. And that's that's 30%. Uh, we look at QQQ, which is actually a lot lower. Um, from the all-time high, we'd be looking at about negative 40. And uh, because the uh, the NASDAQ is going down a lot faster than the S&P, it would make sense that QQQ could go down by 40 for S&P to go down by 30. Uh-oh. Yep. And then we look at ARC, which again, going back to our psychology chart, it's pretty close to that 37 area. The psychology matches, and what I'll be looking for is gonna be people on YouTube, people on Twitter, uh, people out there in the interwebs, um, just getting capitulated, getting angry, and then getting depressed. Oh, uh, well, right, whose fault is it? Who shorted the market? How did the government allow this to happen? And then getting depressed. My, reti my retirement money is lost. How can we pay for all this new stuff? I'm an idiot. I'm seeing a lot of people start this, but I'm not seeing the broader consensus. I'm also seeing a lot of people make fun of Kathy, but I'm not seeing anyone angry at her, which is why I still believe that we're not quite in that bottoming area. Capitulation is the start of the bottoming process. It is a long path. It can be treacherous. So there we go. Um, some of the riskiest assets are now flashing that big warning. And on the flip side, we're seeing some of the, uh, the things we don't want to be going higher all putting in wins, including the dollar with a win, uh, basically taking out uh, right uh, multi-year highs. We have not seen this level going back to um, 2003, right? This is a 20-year high. We look at TNX. Uh, right, TNX here, right? Making fresh highs, and it's over 3%. It just can't stop. Um, just keeps going higher. And then we look at the VIX. And the VIX is putting in another one too, over 30, which is a level where the market is feeling uneasy. Right, Another W looks just like uh, DXY. So everything is poised to uh, uh, for us to confirm that bear market. And um, if we now look at some of these charts, let's go through the S&P. Just to wrap this up, um, let's go through here. Right, we got our quarterly chart. Yeah, that's a bear break. Um, we'd have to suck it all the way back up and get above 454 to invalidate it. So we got uh, right just under two months left. Uh, it's a tall ask, especially with what we heard from the Fed. Tall ask. And the risk here is that if we now have two quarters of contraction, um, when's the last time that happened? Well, 2014 is not really a contraction here. It's basically flat, then one down, one down, one down, one down. So we have to go back to a previous period in time where we have two quarters of contraction. Ah, uh, crap, right? Uh, 2011, yeah, up a little bit. Um, this one, I don't think is the same one we're going through now. I'm looking at 2008, right? One, two, three, four, five, six quarters of contraction. Oh, no. Then we look back to where? To 2000, where we got one, two, three, four, dead cap bounce, one, dead cap bounce, one, two, dead cap bounce, and then the reversal. So we cannot ignore that if history is repeating, it's not going to look exactly the same, but having two negative quarters back to back without any recovery is very bad. It looks very bad. Looking at the monthly, we can now note that we are below all the area where all the dip buyers were excited to buy, below 430 and uh, to roughly 415. That's all red now and a rejection here. So not looking good at all. Looking on the weekly chart, 
Um, we can note here that, again, S&P is now still in a funnel lower. The volume is definitely confirming the move by five weeks of back-to-back -back increasing red volume, and uh, we're going lower. Every upper wick is sold off. On the daily chart, we can note that um, we've now lost our all-time high connect, um, going back to that 2020 high we just mentioned before, and uh, we are now trending down. So excluding this, uh, this false breakout, we're now respecting the downtrend with a rejection here on Friday. And the volume is increasing here, it's very obvious. Looking on the hourly, we can now note that, um, again, for the last couple of weeks, um, just looking at the funnel lower here, it's very obvious too. Um, we can note that we spent uh, one, two false breaks above, one, two false breaks below, and a little bit here. But for the most part, we are respecting the downtrend. And this is very important because if we keep respecting it, um, I think I wanted to go back to the daily chart. If we keep respecting it, if we go to the daily chart here, where does this land, this 400 test? This 400 test pretty much lands right here at June 1st. So June 1st is going to be the day where we meet this bear apex here at 400. When is that? It's the start of balance sheet runoff. Oh, no. Oh, no. No, no, no. Yep. Sorry. Um, looking at QQQ now, let's look at some other weekly charts. Um, QQQ, we can note here that, uh, again, bearish. Uh, we got a new yearly low. We have an inverted hammer. It does not look pretty. Vaughn confirms the bear move. Next stop would be 300 here. XLF, uh, breaking the range. So XLF has now fallen out of the range here, right? It's got a doji. It's up by 23 cents on the week. I do not really trust this, though. With the Fed increasing rates, this should have been up a whole lot more. What does that mean? It just means people don't want to hold on to anything. Anything's better than holding on to stocks right now. Cash, bonds, whatever. XLV, putting in an IHS. It's got a doji here, barely right on the week, down by basically half a percent. Volume is on par, not elevated. It seems okay. Um, then we can look at the Dow. The Dow, uh, right, stair-stepping lower versus uh, waterfalling. The volume here is also getting trapped now because we are below the low. Um, volume is increasing, but not overly, uh, overly, uh, overly high. And we already talked about ARC. IWM already talked about it too, right? I think we're going to hit this base here, right? 170s, 175. I don't know the exact level, but it seems imminent like it's going to hit now. Looking at some of our big dogs as well. Let's just get through them really fast here. Tesla, right below the green line, below the previous base, hugging on the 50 MA. I don't know if it's going to hold. If it doesn't, look how below. This would be new for Tesla. It's already down by um, 28 off the high. Usually that is a strong dip by area. It did dead cat bounce to only be down by about 17% 17, 17 off the highs, but it's stolen out here. Again, only down by half a percent, but if this thing starts to crack, it's going to hurt. Um, Apple, um, again, largest stock in all indexes and uh, clearly showing us here that it's stronger than the others by only being down by 37 cents or 0 0.23. Still holding the 50, just like Tesla, still a leader. We need it to lead. We need it to break over 165 if the market's going to recover. Microsoft, um, stuck in that bear flag, looks just like SPY, right? Stuck in a flag here right around the lows, rejected off the uptrend, hugging the downtrend, doesn't look great. Um, Amazon, yucky, yucky. This one broke bearish uh, a while ago. There's our there's our break. There's the dead cat bounce. There's the rejection on the 50. There's the follow through selling. Does not look good. Elevated volume as well. Um, now we can look at Google. Ah, Google, my old friend. Uh, closing green on the week. Very impressive. Why? Well, people are traveling again. So, right, no surprise that uh, they're getting a little bit more um, activity. But I'm not sure that this is uh, going to be a range that we want to really be doing anything on. Why? Let it get back above the green line. It's looking okay because it closed green, but it's already making fresh lows. So dead cat bounce. NVIDIA looks the same. Um, new, new yearly low, um, rejecting at the downtrend, already below the 50, below the anchored VWAP, which means everyone's red. Facebook, um, closing at 1.65, uh, green volume coming in. This looks like short covering. Um, I don't know what it's going to do. It stopped going down. Facebook being a leader is not a stock that gives me confidence to hold on through this market. All right. Um, I believe that is it. So I thank you for watching. And um, there will be another, another video that queues up here in a moment, which is going to walk you through my bear market of 2022 2.0 thesis. And if uh, you enjoyed the video, I would really appreciate a thumbs up and a comment if you were still watching. Thank you for uh, tuning in. And I look forward to seeing you for our regular scheduled stream next week or 